Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text is the Gospel lesson from Luke 23. Two other men, both criminals, were also let out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. They divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly. We are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. That's the text. A 10-year-old boy was having great difficulty in his math studies. In fact, he had been failing for quite some time. His frustrated parents decided to go all out to do everything they could to get their son to learn math and to help him. First they had him stay after school. and They worked with him hard at home. They even hired a private tutor. Nothing seemed to work. Finally, they decided to put him into a private Catholic school. The very first day at school, he ran home, locked himself in his room to study. He came down only for supper and then returned to his room to study more. This became the pattern every day for the whole school quarter. He came home, studied, ate, studied, and went to bed. At the end of the quarter, his parents received his report card. To their delight, they saw that he had an A-plus in math. Astonished, the parents asked him about the dramatic change. Was it the tutor, they asked? No, he replied. Was it something that we said that convinced you to change? No, he said. Well, what was it, they asked in wonderment. It was that school, he said. When I saw that man nailed to the plus sign, I knew they meant business. (laughs) Folks, as we face the cross in this series, one thing becomes crystal clear. God the Father meant business when he gave his one and only son to be nailed to that sign, that cross. Last week in this series, we looked at the crucifix, the body of Christ nailed to the cross. And we know that Jesus didn't stay on the cross. He rose from the dead and lives forever. And so in our tradition, we We typically use the empty cross to remember that sacrifice of Jesus. And yet there is no denying that seeing the body of Christ crucified opens different windows into your heart than the empty cross. To see it is to be confronted by the consequences of our sin. And I hope to pray, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Today we're going to look at the crucifixion site itself. When we do that, when we zoom out from the cross of Christ, we remember that there were three crosses at the site of Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus was not crucified in a cathedral between two candles, but on a real cross between real criminals. Two others crucified with Jesus and seeing, facing His cross in a way no two human beings ever did or ever will. It's not all that unusual to see Romans crucifying 
multiple people at once. They typically went for maximum impact with their crucifixions as a deterrent to crime. I mean, in our system, we argue whether capital punishment is a deterrent to crime. There was no argument in the Roman Empire to see the roads lined with crosses was definitely a deterrent. Particularly then to uh, revolt, Romans had zero tolerance for anyone trying to challenge the authority of the mighty Roman Empire. Josephus tells us that when uh, the Romans were besieging Jerusalem at 70 AD, Jesus predicted that event, by the way. But the Roman general Titus at one point in that siege crucified at least 500 Jews every single day. He records that so many were crucified outside the walls that there was not room enough for the crosses and not enough crosses for the bodies. It was an absolutely ruthless demonstration that was meant to show the Jews once and for all who was in charge. There had been many little insurrections leading up to that one, and the Romans were tired of it. In fact, if you examine all of the different gospel writers in these events, we find out that it is very likely that the criminals that were crucified with Jesus had been also in an insurrection of their own. Do you remember when Pilate was trying to squirm out of condemning, taking the responsibility for condemning Jesus? The Bible says that it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. And so in desperation, he tried to play in the crowd's sympathy by having them choose between the murderer Barabbas or this righteous man Jesus. If the crowd hadn't been really stacked with temple supporters, the obvious choice would have been Jesus. Instead, the Bible says, with one voice they cried out, away with this man, release Barabbas to us. And Luke gives us this insight. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. I think there's every reason to assume that those two crucified next to Jesus had also been involved, and that if Barabbas had not been freed, his cross probably would have been there as well. At any rate, there they were on a Roman cross, lifted up and facing the one with the crown, the king of the Jews. And they watched as important people, priests and scribes and Pharisees, gathered around that center cross and mocked and cursed and jeered at Jesus. And that was strange. Normally, those guys wouldn't be caught dead at a crucifixion, so to speak. They were taunting Jesus and saying, let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they're processing all of this. King of Israel? What nonsense is that? They're looking at him, he's just an ordinary guy like them, in agony just like them. And so Matthew tells us that both of the criminals heaped insults on him. But then they heard and saw one of the most amazing events to ever occur in the history of mankind. They saw someone being crucified, being nailed to the cross, lifted up, and in his cry of agony saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Must have seemed like absolute foolishness. And so one of the criminals simply continued, Aren't you the Christ? Hurling insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us while you're at it. Maybe there was some kind of vindictive pleasure in taking out his anguish and his anger on somebody else, but something began to happen in the heart of the other guy. As he continued to watch Jesus and listen to the things that he said from the cross, and gradually the insults began to die on his lips. Then something happened that has happened millions of times since that Friday morning, and yet is still a miracle, he began to see Jesus, to really see Jesus Christ. And he saw in him the exact opposite of everything he saw in himself, of everything that he believed. 
He saw in him a depth of love and a power that was beyond anything that he had seen in his cynical world. His eyes turned upward to the inscription above Jesus' thorn-crowned head, Jesus Nazarenus Rex Eudorum, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And suddenly he knew the inscription was not a joke. Pilate had stumbled literally on the truth. He was a king. He was the king. And at that moment he wanted nothing more than somehow to be included in that kingdom. He knew he had no right to expect it. He knew he had deserved his sentence and it was going to be served in full. But still he wanted someone to know that even though he had thrown the rest of his life away, in the end he stood with this king. And so he came to his defense. He rebuked his partner in crime who was still insulting Jesus and said, Don't you fear God since you are under the same sentence. We're getting what we deserve. This man has done nothing wrong. Then he turned to Jesus and he said those beautiful words of faith. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Folks, this really is one of the most touching scenes in the Bible. And it shows the simplicity of salvation. Criminal didn't have to have a degree in theology. He didn't have the opportunity to clean up his act and work his way as if anyone could into heaven. He didn't have a long, detailed prayer of salvation at an altar call. He just had faith in Jesus. He received from him far more than his wildest expectations. His Lord turned his face to him and with a look of compassion and love beyond anything he had ever experienced, said simply, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Folks, I want to take the, the scene of the three crosses and bring it right here into the sanctuary to us. Because in a sense, you and I are on those other crosses as well. That's the reason we have the cross of Christ so central in this place of worship. That's the reason I'm doing a Face the Cross series this year for Lent. Every time you face that cross, you face a decision. It demands a response. Either it will be a cross of rejection or it will be a cross of reception. There is no middle ground. Jesus is occupying that spot. I hope you'll allow me to retell a fit for life in Christ story. Most of you have been through it, so I usually tell this story. Most of you have heard it before. I think it fits here very well. man made an appointment to talk to a pastor about this, about God, about salvation. He'd heard about Christianity. He thought maybe he should know a little bit more, so he came to satisfy his curiosity. Well, Pastors love those opportunities, and so pastor launched a, his most eloquent presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and what Jesus did for us. He painted the picture of Jesus on the cross, dying in our sins, taking the punishment that should have been ours, that Jesus went into the tomb. He painted the open tomb and the resurrection and the victory of Christ that is our victory. And if we believe in him, we will live forever in heaven. He talked some more about faith, and he talked about how Jesus wants us to be part of the church, his, his bride, the church, and, and how you know God has given us gifts in the church, and they're to be used for him, and, and so on. And talked about really making Jesus the Lord of your life, the one in charge of you, and that he calls the shots and not you, and so on. And finally, he wrapped it up and asked the man if he had any questions. And he says, well, that's all very nice, Pastor. I, I guess I would like to be included in God's kingdom someday. But, you know, I, I'm not really sure I'm willing to be tied down to a church right now. And maybe now that I've heard this gospel, I, I can just sort of store it away. And then later in life, I'll, I'll bring it out. And, you know, maybe even on my deathbed, then I'll surely remember what you said and make my vows to the Lord. Well, said the pastor, I've heard some of those last-minute confessions, and, you know, they're pretty rare. 
And a lot of times you have to wonder about the sincerity of that kind of faith. Oh, said the man, I don't know, I've read a little bit of the Bible too, and, and what about the thief on the cross? Right? Pastor paused for a minute and simply asked. Maybe you haven't heard that, sorry. Which one? Which one? There were two on either side of Jesus. Both saw the same evidence. Both heard from his lips, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And only one found a place for repentance and faith in his heart. To only one did Jesus say, Today you will be with me in paradise. And so the Bible says, Now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. So folks, if you have been on the fence in any way, shape, or form as you face the cross, in terms of whether or not to truly have Jesus be the Lord of your life and the, the one who calls the shots for you. It's time to get off on the side of Jesus. Learn to pray the prayer of that repentant thief. Lord, remember me. Remember not my sins and my guilt, but remember the love that took you to the cross and led you to call me friend because I believe in you. Because you are my Lord. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes our ability even to understand it, keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.